In section 6.3, we're still solving our trig equations. This time we're going to be focusing on half angle identities. Um, well, half angles and, and our double angle, multiple angle identities. Remember that the method that I prefer is to find all solutions, to start with all solutions first, whether that's what's asked first or not, to start with all solutions, and then look back at the given interval. Now, we're not going to work through every single problem in the packet because it's it was ambitious to start with. It would take a really long time to get through them all, and a lot of them are repetitious. So I may just give you some answers. We'll, we'll go through one on each page slowly, and I will give you answers for the other one on that page. Okay, so here we go. Um, the interval we're given is in radians, so we're going to be looking for solutions and giving our solutions in radians. We're going to start with all solutions, but we have to begin by solving the equation. So our equation we're given to solve is 2 times the cosine of the half angle minus square root 2 is equal to 0. So we have 2 cosine of x over 2 minus square root 2 equals 0. I'm going to solve for cosine of x over 2. I'm going to do that by moving that square root over and then dividing by 2 so that I end up with cosine of the half angle equals square root 2 over 2. Okay, square root 2 over 2 is a, is a value for cosine on our unit circle, so we like that. That's lovely. Um, when we set out our solution set, we need to remember first that cosine is periodic over 2 pi, and second that we have solved not for x, but for x half. So we're going to say x half is equal to, well, where is cosine positive square root 2 over 2? Let's look at our unit circle. Cosine is positive, we know, in quadrants 1 and 4 over here. And our cosine function value is square root 2 over 2 at pi fourth and at 7 pi fourth. So those are our two starting places in quadrants 1 and quadrant 4. If I want to draw a little sketch of that real quickly so I don't forget, I know that we've got this 45 at pi fourth and we've got this angle at 7 pi fourths. Those are the locations where we have that cosine function value for the half angle. Every time we come back around to that, we have another value of square root 2 over 2 for cosine. So our starting point, our jumping off point, is, is pi fourth plus 2 pi n, as well as 7 pi fourth plus 2 pi n. That's my all solution statement for pi half, but not for pi, or excuse me, for x half, but not for x. I apologize. To solve for x, I need to multiply everything by 2. 2 times x half is x, so we've solved for x, and then I distribute this to everything that's going on inside there. So 2 times pi fourth moves that to pi half plus 4 pi n. Now notice that it, it goes to that periodicity as well. So this is kind of an expansion. We're stepping away from the unit circle. We are doing a transformation when we move from x half to x. So if I distribute that 2, I end up with x equals, well, pi half is a starting place, periodic over 4 pi now, and then 7 pi half plus 4 pi n. And this, this statement is true where n is any integer. Now, this is my all solutions statement. This is B, my all solutions. We're asked to look at what solutions exist within this interval 0 to 2 pi. So let's start with n is 0, where n is 0 we have pi half and we have 7 pi half. Well, pi half is inside that interval 0 to 2 pi, but 7 pi half is already outside the interval. Um, 7 pi half, 2 pi would be 4 pi halves. So 7 pi halves is already outside that interval. If I went to n equals 1, I would have to add 4 pi to pi half, which would be 4 and a half pi, or 9 pi half, which is outside my interval. So outside the interval. The only value that satisfies this equation that is inside the interval 0 to 2 pi is pi half. That's the only angle 
that satisfies my equation. Okay. So for this next one, and this should have been B, not A. I just noticed that I have a typo on my, oh no, A and B, never mind. Just ignore me. Okay, for the next one, we would solve. And when we solve our equation, we would get sine of x half equals one half. So we're looking for where sine is a positive one half. Sine is a positive one half in quadrants one and two at pi six in quadrant one and at five pi six in quadrant two. Like I said, I was gonna skip this, we're doing it super fast instead. So x half, if I'm doing my all solution statement, x half is equal to uh, what angles at pi six and sine is periodic over two pi, or five pi six and sine is periodic over two pi. Remember that we don't stop there. We have to solve for x. So we're gonna multiply everything by two in order to solve for x. When we do that, our all solution statement becomes pi third plus four pi n and five pi thirds plus four pi n, where n is any integer. That's my all solution statement. What solutions exist within my, um, within my interval? Okay, so there is our all solution statement. And then um, after that, I'm going to check to see within my interval. So within my interval, if n equals 0, that would give me pi third and 5 pi third. Those are both inside that interval, so that's good. But if I move to n, my, n equals 1, then I would have to be adding 4 pi, 4 pi to both of those. If I add 4 pi, I am necessarily outside the interval 0 to 2 pi. So there are no other solutions that are going to fit within that interval, just the pi third and the five pi third. Okay, that one was pretty quick and easy. Let's look at the next page. For our second example, instead of a half angle identity, we're looking at a double angle. Um, let's solve using this double angle. So we have that cosine of 2x is equal to sine of x. I got a couple of things going on here. I have different um, different trig functions, which isn't ideal, and I have different arguments. My arguments aren't the same. My arguments have to match. So I'm gonna have to pull out this cosine 2x in order to get my argument just x, not 2x. Let's look at our double angle identities. On our identity sheet, when I find my double angle identities, I see I have three cosine double angle identities to choose from. Well, the one I want to pick is the one that's gonna allow me just to have a single trig function. So the one I want is in terms of sine. When I do this substitution, I have one minus um, two sine square x is equal to sine x. One minus two sine square x equals sine x. Okay, so my arguments match. I just have a single trig function to work with, and I have a squared term, which means I need to think of this as solving a quadratic. I want my squared term to be positive, so I'm gonna move everything over to the left and set my equation equal to zero. That gives me zero equals two sine square x plus sine x minus one. This is factorable. When I reverse FOIL, I have two sine x times sine x as the first terms in each of those binomial factors. Oh, I forgot my equal sign, excuse me guys. Zero equals. And then one is just one. For this one to be negative, my signs are gonna be different. I want a positive term in the middle, so this two sine x needs to be positive. Minus one sine x would give me that middle positive sine x if I were to foil it back together. So these are the two factors I need to set equal to zero and solve for. I have two sine x minus one equals zero, and I have sine x plus one equals zero. Well, if two sine x minus one equals zero, that means sine of x equals one half. And if sine x plus one equals zero, that means my equation is satisfied when sine x equals negative one. Well, what are my angles that cause these things to happen? Well, where is my value of sine positive one half? Sine is positive in quadrants one and two. In fact, it's one, positive one half at pi six and five pi six again. 
Sine is equal to negative 1 down at the quadrantal angle right here. Sine is equal to negative 1 there at 3 pi half. So I have those three locations, those three angle values, and every rotation after that are going to satisfy my equation. When I set up my all solutions statement, I'm going to say all values of x, and notice that my argument is x here, so I'm not going to have to do anything weird to that to fix it. All values of x um, where I've got pi half plus 2 pi n because sine is periodic over 2 pi. I have 5 pi, 5 pi 6. I, I wrote it right and I said it wrong. Pi 6 plus 2 pi n, 5 pi 6 plus 2 pi n, and 3 pi half plus 2 pi n. Those are the three locations that are going to satisfy that equation for any integer n. That's my all solution statement. But I need to make sure I go back and answer the question completely. I'm asked for the set of solutions in that first rotation 0 to 2 pi. Well, where n equals 0, I have those starting values, pi 6, 5 pi 6, and 3 pi half. That is all within one um, within this interval. If I go to n equals 1, that means that I would need to add 2 pi to each of those angles. If I add 2 pi, because those are already positive values, if I add 2 pi, I've moved it outside my interval. So I don't have to worry about any additional solutions within the interval. Just pi 6, 5 pi 6, and 3 pi half. Okay. The next problem, we are not going to take our time to work through slowly. We have that argument that doesn't match again, so I have to use a substitution with, for that double angle. I'm going to pick a different identity because I need it to equal cosine. I need to stay in terms of cosine, so I would choose 2 cosine square x minus 1, and I need to solve that equation. When I solve that equation, my all solution statement becomes, and I'm just going to give you the result down here, becomes 2 pi third plus 2 pi n, 4 pi third plus 2 pi n, and 0 plus 2 pi n, where n is any integer. That's my all solution statement. And again, those are going to be the only three angles within that interval. 0, 2 pi third, 4 pi third because I can't go around to 2 pi. This one, the next solution here would be 2 pi, but that's not inclusive, so that's not within that interval. Okay, after you've taken the time to work through that, make sure you understand. Let's look at this next one. So solving an equation with a multi-angle identity. Let's see what we're asked to do here. <clears throat> For this one, we have 2 cosine squared theta minus 2 sine squared theta plus 1 equals 0. Well, you know what? we got squared functions. That automatically makes me think about my Pythagorean identity. My basic Pythagorean identity is sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. i got to pick one or the other um, and get everything in terms of uh, either sine squared or cosine squared. I'm going to do the substitution here and, saw and, and replace cosine squared. If I replace cosine squared theta, what I would replace it with would be 1 minus sine squared theta. So that gives me 2 times 1 minus sine squared theta minus 2 sine squared theta plus 1 equals 0. Let's distribute this 2 and see what we've got. When I combine like terms, I have 3 minus 4 sine squared theta equals 0 and I need to start solving for sine. So I'm going to move that 3 over, it becomes negative, and then I divide by a negative 4. And a negative 3 divided by a negative 4 gives me sine squared theta equals a positive 3 fourths. Now, anytime I have to solve for sine by um, eliminating that square, I have to take the square root. When I take the square root of both sides, hopefully you remember this from college algebra, you take plus or minus because you're not sure if the variable started out positive or negative. You have to consider both. Okay, so sine theta equals plus and minus square root 3 over 2. 
positive and negative. So anywhere my sine function value, I have an angle whose sine function value is square root 3 over 2, whether it's positive or negative, it is going to satisfy my equation. So let's think about where that happens. Um, square root 3 over 2 for sine function happens, oh look at this, we're in degrees, not radians, so that's, that's nice. So it happens at 60 degrees, it happens over here at 120 degrees, it happens down here at 240, and it happens over here at 300. Those four angles all have, um, have a sine function value of square root 3 over 2. Now, what I notice is that even though sine is periodic over 2 pi or over 360 degrees, since I'm using the plus and minus options, I can just go 180. I could say 60 plus 180 plus 180 plus 180, and it's going to get those angles. If I start at 120 and do plus 180, it gets these angles, all of those. So I only need two statements for my all solutions. So B, all solutions right there, is going to be um, theta equal to 60 degrees plus 180 in or 120 degrees plus 180 in because that 180 gets all of those solutions. I don't have to write four separate statements where n is any integer. So that's my most simplified all solution statement. I could write out all four. I could do 60 plus 360, 120 plus 360, 240 plus 360, 300 plus 360. That's a lot more work than I have to do though. So I'm gonna just write my more, more con condensed so, um, all solution statement. And then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna say, okay, what about inside the interval zero to 360? Well, where n is, <laughs> where n is equal to zero, I have 60 degrees and I have 120 degrees. Then for n equals 1, I add 180 to both of those. When I add 180, 60 plus 180 gets that 240 degree angle in quadrant 3. 120 plus 180 gets me to that 300 degree angle in quadrant 4. If I go another round, if I try n equals 2, I would be adding 180 again. If I add 180 here, I have moved beyond that interval. If I add another 180 degrees, I am outside my interval. So the only solutions that fit within my interval are 60, 120, 240, 300 degrees. Make sure you use your degree symbol. If you don't write your degree symbol, it's considered to be radians, and that's wrong because 60 radians is not the same thing as 60 degrees. Okay, um, you know what, this has gone more quickly than I thought. We're just gonna go ahead and we are going to, um, we're gonna do this one kind of kind of briefly, but we are gonna talk our way through it. We're still in degrees. We've got four sine theta, cosine theta. Um, we gotta do something about getting that in terms of just sine or cosine. Hopefully you recognize that this looks like a double angle identity. Oh yeah, we definitely need to do this one. This looks like a double angle identity. If I took two times two sine theta cosine theta, that is a double angle identity. That's my sine double angle identity. So four sine theta cosine theta, same thing as two times two sine theta cosine theta, where this is double angle sine. So that's two sine double angle two theta equals square root three which gives me sine of two theta equals square root three over two, and that's a, a value on my unit circle for special angles. Now, when I solve, I have not solved for theta. I've solved for two theta. So where is my sine function value positive square root three over two? Now, we said it, it's, it's, we've got these four angles where sine is square root three over two. Quadrants one and two, it's positive. Quadrants three and four, it's negative. We're not interested in negative, just the positive values for this for um, this equation. So we are just interested in 60 degrees and 120 degrees. Because, um, because we cannot, we're not doing those alternate, we have to list both of these as separate, um, separate values with a rotation of 360 in. So 60 degrees plus 360 in, or 120 degrees plus 360 degrees in, those, both of those locations are gonna give me angles that satisfy my equation. 
I haven't solved for theta. I've just solved for two theta. Remember when we solved for x over two, we multiplied everything by two? Now that we've solved for two theta, we need to divide everything by two. So half times two gives me theta. That's what I was looking for. Half of 60 is 30 plus 180 n or 60 plus 180 n. Now we can't go back where n is any integer. n is any integer. We cannot go back and map this back onto a circle. Um, we have just done a transformation. We stepped away from our unit circle, but we have answered all solutions. This is my all solution statement. All right, we've got our all solution statement. Let's talk about the answer for the angles just within this interval 0 to 360. Now, if n equals 0, we've got 30 degrees and 60 degrees. Notice that I go for where I've solved for theta, not my statement where I solved for 2 theta. So where n equals 0, my starting place is 30 and 60. Then I do n equals 1. Well, now I'm adding 180 because I made that adjustment, remember. So I'm not adding 360, I'm adding 180. If I add 180 to 30 degrees, I'm at 210. If I add 180 to 60 degrees, I'm at 240. And both of those are still within my interval. Can I go again? Well, if I add 180 here, I get 390, and that's going to be even bigger. So no, now I've moved outside that interval from 0 to 360. But I do have these four angles, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, um, 210, and 240, all with my degree symbols. Those are the angles that satisfy my equation within that interval 0 to 360. Okay, that was an important one to do. Let's look at this last page, example four. We've got two practice problems here. <coughs> okay, so let's tackle problem example four, equations with a multiple angle. Let's look and see what we got. We got cotangent of a double angle, cosecant of a double angle, and one. Our interval is zero to two pi, so we're back in radians when we look for our solutions. I, I don't have anything for cotangent. Oh, you not, no, I do have a link for cotangent and cosecant. One of my Pythagorean identi identities is cotangent square x plus 1 equals cosecant square x. So let's do a little rearranging. Let's move this over here and say cotangent 2x minus 1 equals cosecant 2x. I just rearranged my terms. But that does not match my identity, that uh, my identity has to be squared. So let's square both sides so that we can move towards seeing what we can do about substituting in for either cotangent or cosecant. So if I square this binomial on the left, I get cotangent square of 2x uh, minus 2 cotangent 2x plus 1. And if I square this, I just have cosecant square 2x. Notice that I square the trig function. I do not square the argument. The argument remained 2x. Um, cosecant square 2x, I would just do this substitution here and replace it with cotangent square 2x plus 1. Make sure you are careful about what argument that you keep 2x as your argument. So this right side of my equation becomes cotangent square 2x plus 1. I'm not changing anything on the left side here. I've got cotangent square 2x minus 2 cotangent 2x plus 1. All right, let's work on solving. Um, it's, it's quadratic as it stands, but when I start rearranging terms, I see that that squared term is going to add to 0. So instead of setting it equal to 0, let's move this 1 back over here. And I get negative 2 cotangent 2x equals 0. Well, when I finish solving for cotangent of 2x, I divide both sides by that negative 2. 0 divided by anything is just 0. So what I have is cotangent 2x equals 0. I've solved for, for um, a set of angles, but notice that my argument is 2x, not x. I'm going to have to take care of that. So 2x equals, well, for what angle is my cotangent function value 0? Cotangent is 0 at pi half. Cotangent is 0 at pi half because cotangent is x over y, and x is 0 here. Um, 
but I don't have to do both of those, pi half, three pi half, because cotangent is periodic over pi. So if I just make the single statement, I can say I'm at pi half plus pi in, and that covers every possible solution. All right, but again, my argument is not x. I need to solve for x. To solve for x, I multiply everything by 1 half. So my all solution statement becomes x equals pi fourth plus pi half n, where n is any integer. That's my starting place. That's my all solutions statement. Now what I'm asked though is to figure out how many of those solutions are between 0 and 2 pi. What I need to remember is that I squared to solve. Whenever I square to solve, we learned this back in college algebra, I have to check for extraneous solutions. I have to check to see if I created one or more extraneous solutions. So let's go through and let's check our solutions as long as we have solutions within that interval 0 to, to 2 pi. So where n is 0, let's start over. Where n is 0, I have pi fourth. So first I need to check to see if pi fourth is going to work or if pi fourth is extraneous. So in my original equation, that's what I'm checking it in. I'm going to say, okay, my original equation was cotangent of 2 times pi fourth minus cosecant of 2 times pi fourth should be 1 if that is a valid solution. Well, 2 times pi fourth is pi half. So I've got cotangent at pi half minus cosecant at pi half equals 1. Cotangent at pi half is 0. That's why we picked it. What is cosecant at pi half? Well, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. Sine at pi half is 1. So 0 minus 1 equals 1. No, that is not true. That is not true. So this one is extraneous. That's extraneous. OK, so let's check our next possible solution, where n is 1. We would be at from pi fourth plus pi half. That's my next solution because that's what I add is pi half. Pi fourth plus pi half gives me three pi fourths. So I'm going to check n equals, I checked n equals zero. It was extraneous. Now I'm going to check n equals one. n equals one is at three pi fourths. So I've got cotangent of two times three pi fourths because that's my original function, original equation, minus cosecant of two times three pi fourths should be 1. Let's see if that's true here. Well, that gives me cotangent of um, 3 pi half minus cosecant of 3 pi half should be 1. Cotangent at 3 pi half is 0. That's why we picked it. Cosecant at 3 pi half, reciprocal of sine. At 3 pi half, we're down here. That is negative 1. 1 minus negative 1 does equal 1. That checks. That's a valid solution. That is a valid solution within my interval. What if I go again? What if I go to n equals 2? Well, at n equals 2, I'm going to add another pi half here. So 2 pi fourths, which would be at 5 pi fourths. That's within my interval, so we need to check. Um, that gives me a cotangent of 2 times 5 pi fourths minus cosecant of 2 times 5 pi fourths should be 1, which is cotangent of 5 pi half minus cosecant of 5 pi half equals 1. Now, let's stop and think about this for a minute. Where is 5 pi half? 5 pi half is the same thing as a full rotation and then back up here to pi half. That means I'm going to have the same values as I had here, and I get 0 minus 1 equals 1, which is not true. So that solution is extraneous. Can I go again? Can I go to n equals 3? Well, if I add pi half to this, I get um, 7 pi fourth. That's still within my interval. And when I make that adjustment by plugging it in, where do you think I'm going to end up? Yep, I'm going to end up down at that 3 pi half location again. Let's, let's show you. We've got cotangent of 2 times 7 pi fourth is 14 pi fourth or 7 pi half. 
minus cosecant of 7 pi half equals 1. Well, 7 pi half is the same thing. It's the same location as 3 pi halves. So I'm back down there, and I get 0 minus a negative 1. That is a valid solution. So out of, and if I, if I did one more rotation, I would be at 9 pi fourths, which is outside my interval. So my solution set for valid solutions inside my interval are 3 pi fourths and 7 pi fourths. Okay, we are going to do this last one because it gets us to a problem without, uh, without nice special angles on my unit circle. So we are going to work through it um, at least to start so that we can talk about what that looks like. I may need extra space. I'm probably going to need extra space, but we're going to start here. So we've got tangent 3x plus secant 3x equals 2. That um, reminds me of one of my Pythagorean identities. So what I'm going to, my Pythagorean identity that it reminds me of is tangent square x plus 1 equals secant square x. So that, that lets me know I'm going to want to do some rearranging and then I'm going to square. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to say, all right, let's do tangent 3x equals 2 minus secant 3x. And then I'm going to square both sides. When I square both sides to solve, I know that when I get done, I'm going to have to check for extraneous solutions. So I have tangent square of 3x. My argument does not change. And then I foil this side and get 4 minus 4 secant 3x plus secant square of 3x. I'm going to do my substitution. Tangent 3x is equal to secant square x minus 1, or secant square 3x minus 1. So I'm going to substitute in here with secant square 3x minus 1. And it looks like I've got a quadratic function to solve, quadratic equation to solve again. But when I start moving terms over and I subtract this secant square, it adds to zero. So let's just go ahead and um, move, move this 4 over. So I subtract 4 and I get negative 5 equals a negative 4 secant of 3x. So when I divide by negative 4 to solve, I get to the statement that secant of 3x is going to be equal to 5 fourths. Well, 5 fourths is not a special value on my unit circle. So I'm not going to have nice, pretty angles. Um, secant square, secant 3x equals 5 fourths. Secant is hard to think in terms of. If you'll allow it, we're going to transform this and say, you know what? Secant of 3x means the same thing as cosine 3x equal to 4 fifths. Okay, so we've got cosine 3x equals 4 over 5. Well, I'm going to have to use my cosine inverse values to figure out what that's going to be. Let me get another sheet of paper. I told you we were going to need extra paper for this. Okay, so I've got cosine 3x equals 4 fifths. Um, what this means is I'm going to be using cosine inverse. Make sure that you are in radians because I'm dealing with radians for this problem. My argument is 3x. When I do cosine inverse of 4 fifths, it's going to return a single function value. Remember, cosine inverse is defined for quadrants 1 and quadrant 2. Cosine is positive in quadrant 1, negative in quadrant 2. So when I plug in cosine inverse of 4 fifths, I get a radian value in quadrant 1. The radian value I get in quadrant 1 is 0 0.6435 radians. Again, make sure you're in radian mode in your calculator. So cosine is positive in quadrant 1. That's what I get when I plug it into my calculator. I know, though, that cosine is also positive down here in quadrant 4. So what is this radian value in quadrant 4? Well, remember our um, reference angle idea. 
This angle is 0.6435 radians away from the x-axis. This angle is also 0.6435 radians away from the x-axis. To figure out this value, I will do 2 pi minus that, 0.6435. So what I get as my all solutions starting place is 3x equal to 0.6435 plus 2 pi n, or this value, which comes out to be 5.6397 plus 2 pi n. Those are the two locations that satisfy my equation with an argument of 3x. I don't want to keep an argument of 3x. To get rid of that argument 3x, I'm going to need to multiply everything by a third or divide everything by 3. Totally up to you how you want to think about it. When I divide by 3, I get an argument of x, and my starting place becomes 0.2145 plus 2 pi thirds in, or 1.8799 plus 2 pi thirds in. So that's my all possible solutions where n is any integer. Now these are just proposed solutions. These are just proposed solutions. And I say these are just proposed solutions because I squared to solve. When I squared to solve, I have to go back and check. Now the interval that I'm going to check for is 0 to 2 pi. That's my interval that I'm interested in. Um, when I check for my interval, that interval that I'm interested in is 0 to 2 pi. So my first solution I'm going to check is going to be this one. And if I check n equals 0 for 0 0.2145, I plug that into my original function. I have 3 times 0.2145, tangent of that, plus secant of 3 times 0.2145, should come out to be 2. Well, secant is 1 over cosine. So, so when I use my calculator for this, I, do, I, I literally plug in tangent of 3 times 0.2145. I get a value of 0.74999. And then to do this piece, I have to do 1 over cosine of that value is 0.645, and I want to know if that's 2. It is. Now, I had to, if I don't round things off in my calculator window, it comes out nice and, and exact. If I do round things off, I've got a problem. So this solution works. When I check, um, when I check this next one, and I do tangent of 3 times 1.8799, uh, plus secant of 3 times 1.8799 and see if that is equal to 2. This tangent function value comes out to be negative. My secant function value comes out to be positive. There's no way that equals 2. So this one does not work. That comes out to be extraneous. If I keep working through them, I discover that we get kind of what we did on that last problem, where when it rotates around to that other solution set, this one's not going to work, these are going to work. So I end up with just working with this, where n equals 0, I have that 0 0.2145. If I do n equals 1, I am adding to this, I am adding the 2 pi thirds. That comes out to be 2.3089. If I go n equals 2, I start here and add 2 pi thirds radians again, and I'm at 4.4033. If I go to n equals 3, it pulls me outside of my interval. So these three angles are valid solutions for this, for this equation. I didn't even go back and check anymore here because I discovered that, you know what, when it lands there, it's not going to work because I'm, I'm not in the right quadrants. That first, that tangent function value comes out to be negative and the sum is not going to be 2.